Chapter One, Part Two of the Shadow Line: A Confession by Joseph Conrad. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter One, Part Two. Captain Giles silenced me by the perfect equanimity of his gaze. Nothing to be annoyed about, he murmured reasonably, with an evident desire to soothe the childish irritation he had aroused and he was really a man of an appearance so inoffensive that I tried to explain myself as best as I could. I told him that I did not want to hear any more about what was past and gone. It had been very nice while it lasted, but now it was done with, I preferred not to talk about it or even think about it. I had made up my mind to go home. He listened to the whole tirade in a particular lending-the-ear attitude, as if trying to detect a false note in it somewhere then straightened himself up and appeared to ponder sagaciously over the matter. Yes, you told me you meant to go home. Anything in view there? Instead of telling him that it was none of his business, I said sullenly, nothing that I know of. I had indeed considered that rather blank side of the situation I had created for myself by leaving suddenly my very satisfactory employment, and I was not very pleased with it. I had it on the tip of my tongue to say that common sense had nothing to do with my action, and that therefore it didn't deserve the interest Captain Giles seemed to be taking in it. But he was puffing at a short wooden pipe now, and looked so guileless, dense, and commonplace that it seemed hardly worth while to puzzle him either with truth or sarcasm. He blew a cloud of smoke, then surprised me by a very abrupt, Paid your passage money yet? Overcome by the shameless pertinacity of a man to whom it was rather difficult to be rude, I replied with exaggerated meekness that I had not done so yet. I thought there would be plenty of time to do that tomorrow, and I was about to turn away, withdrawing my privacy from his fatuous, objectless attempts to test what sort of stuff it was made of, when he laid down his pipe in an extremely significant manner, you know, as if a critical moment had come, and leaned sideways over the table between us. Oh, you haven't yet. He dropped his voice mysteriously. Well then, I think you ought to know that there's something going on here. I had never in my life felt more detached from all earthly goings-on. Freed from the sea for a time, I preserved the sailor's consciousness of complete independence from all land affairs. How could they concern me? I gazed at Captain Giles' animation with scorn rather than with curiosity. To his obviously preparatory question whether our steward had spoken to me that day, I said he hadn't. And what's more, he would have had precious little encouragement if he had tried to. I didn't want the fellow to speak to me at all. Unrebuked by my petulance, Captain Giles, with an air of immense sagacity, began to tell me a minute tale about a harbour office peon. It was absolutely pointless. A peon was seen walking that morning on the veranda with a letter in his hand. It was in an official envelope. As the habit of these fellows is, he had shown it to the first white man he came across. That man was our friend in the armchair. He, as I knew, was not in a state to interest himself in any sublunary matters. He could only wave the peon away. The peon then wandered on along the veranda and came upon Captain Giles, who was there by an extraordinary chance. At this point he stopped with a profound look. The letter, he continued, was addressed to the chief steward. Now what could Captain Ellis, the master attendant, want to write to the steward for? The fellow went every morning, anyhow, to the harbour office with his report, for orders or what not. He hadn't been back more than an hour before there was an office peon chasing him with a note. Now what was that for? and he began to speculate. It was not for this, and it could not be for that. As to that other thing, it was unthinkable. The fatuousness of all this made me stare. If the man had not been somehow a sympathetic personality, I would have resented it like an insult. As it was, I felt only sorry for him. Something remarkably earnest in his gaze prevented me from laughing in his face. Neither did I yawn at him, I just stared. His tone became a shade more mysterious. Directly the fellow, meaning the steward, got that note, he rushed for his hat and bolted out of the house. But it wasn't because the note called him to the harbour office. He didn't go there. He was not absent long enough for that. 
He came darting back in no time, flung his hat away, and raced about the dining room, moaning and slapping his forehead. All these exciting facts and manifestations had been observed by Captain Giles. He had, it seems, been meditating upon them ever since. I began to pity him profoundly, and in a tone which I tried to make as little sarcastic as possible, I said that I was glad he had found something to occupy his morning hours. With his disarming simplicity he made me observe, as if it were a matter of some consequence, how strange it was that he should have spent the morning indoors at all. He generally was out before Tiffin, visiting various offices, seeing his friends in the harbour, and so on. He had felt out of sorts somewhat on rising. Nothing much, just enough to make him feel lazy. All this with a sustained holding stare, which in conjunction with the general inanity of the discourse, conveyed the impression of mild, dreary lunacy. And when he hitched his chair a little and dropped his voice to the low note of mystery, it flashed upon him that high professional reputation was not necessarily a guarantee of sound mind. It never occurred to me then that I didn't know in what soundness of mind exactly consisted, and what a delicate and upon the whole unimportant matter it was. With some idea of not hurting his feelings, I blinked at him in an interested manner. But when he proceeded to ask me mysteriously whether I remembered what had passed just now between that steward of ours and that man Hamilton, I only grunted sour assent and turned away my head. Aye, but do you remember every word, he insisted tactfully? I don't know. It's none of my business, I snapped out, consigning moreover the steward and Hamilton aloud to eternal perdition. I meant to be very energetic and final, but Captain Giles continued to gaze at me thoughtfully. Nothing could stop him. He went on to point out that my personality was involved in that conversation. When I tried to preserve the semblance of unconcern, he became positively cruel. I heard what the man had said? Yes. What did I think of it then? He wanted to know. Captain Giles's appearance, excluding the suspicion of mere sly malice, I came to the conclusion that he was simply the most tactless idiot on earth. I almost despised myself for the weakness of attempting to enlighten his common understanding. I started to explain that I did not think anything whatever. Hamilton was not worth a thought. What's such an offensive loafer? Aye, that he is, interjected Captain Giles. Thought or said was below any decent man's contempt, and I did not propose to take the slightest notice of it. This attitude seemed to me so simple and obvious that I was really astonished at Giles giving no sign of assent. Such perfect stupidity was almost interesting. What would you like me to do? I asked, laughing. I can't start a row with him because of the opinion he has formed of me. Of course, I've heard of the contemptuous way he alludes to me, but he doesn't intrude his contempt on my notice. He has never expressed it in my hearing, for even just now he didn't know we could hear him. I should only make myself ridiculous. That hopeless Giles went on puffing at his pipe moodily. All at once his face cleared and he spoke. You missed my point. Have I? I am very glad to hear it, I said. With increasing animation he stated again that I had missed his point. Entirely. And in a tone of growing self-conscious complacency he told me that few things escaped his attention. And he was rather used to think them out and generally from his experience of life and men arrived at the right conclusion. This bit of self-praise, of course, fitted excellently the laborious inanity of the whole conversation. The whole thing strengthened in me that obscure feeling of life being but a waste of days, which half unconsciously had driven me out of a comfortable berth, away from men I liked, to flee from the menace of emptiness, and to find inanity at the first turn. Here was a man of recognized character and achievement disclosed as an absurd and dreary chatterer. And it was probably like this everywhere, from east to west, from the bottom to the top of the social scale. A great discouragement fell on me, a spiritual drowsiness. Giles's voice was going on complacently, the very voice of the universal hollow conceit. And I was no longer angry with it. There was nothing original, nothing new, startling, informing to expect from the world, no opportunities to find out something about oneself, no wisdom to acquire, no fun to enjoy. Everything was stupid and overrated, even as Captain Giles was, 
So be it. The name of Hamilton suddenly caught my ear and roused me up. I thought we had done with him, I said, with the greatest possible distaste. Yes, but considering what we happened to hear just now, I think you ought to do it. Ought to do it? I sat up bewildered. Do what? Captain Giles confronted me very much surprised. Why, do what I have been advising you to try. You go and ask the steward what was there in that letter from the harbour office. Ask him straight out. I remained speechless for a time. Here was something unexpected and original enough to be altogether incomprehensible. I murmured, astounded, but I thought it was Hamilton that you... Exactly. Don't you let him. You do what I tell you. You tackle that steward. You'll make him jump, I bet, insisted Captain Giles, waving his smouldering pipe impressively at me. Then he took three rapid puffs at it. His aspect of triumphant acuteness was indescribable, yet the man remained a strangely sympathetic creature. Benevolence radiated from him ridiculously, mildly, impressively. It was irritating, too. But I pointed out coldly, as one who deals with the incomprehensible, that I didn't see any reason to expose myself to a snub from the fellow. He was a very unsatisfactory steward and a miserable wretch besides, but I would just as soon think of tweaking his nose. Tweaking his nose, said Captain Giles in a scandalized tone. Much use it would be to you. That remark was so irrelevant that one could make no answer to it. But the sense of the absurdity was beginning at last to exercise its well-known fascination. I felt I must not let the man talk to me any more. I got up, observing curtly that he was too much for me, that I couldn't make him out. Before I had time to move away, he spoke again in a changed tone of obstinacy, and puffing nervously at his pipe. Well, he's a no-account cuss, anyhow. You just ask him, that's all. That new manner impressed me, or rather made me pause. But sanity asserting its sway at once, I left the veranda after giving him a mirthless smile. In a few strides I found myself in the dining room, now cleared and empty. But during that short time various thoughts occurred to me, such as that Giles had been making fun of me, expecting some amusement at my expense, that I probably looked silly and gullible, that I knew very little of life. The door facing me across the dining room flew open to my extreme surprise. It was the door inscribed with the word steward, and the man himself ran out of his stuffy philistinish lair in his absurd hunted animal manner, making for the garden door. To this day, I don't know what made me call after him. I say, wait a minute. Perhaps it was the sidelong glance he gave me, or possibly I was yet under the influence of Captain Giles' mysterious earnestness. Well, it was an impulse of some sort, in effect of that force somewhere within our lives which shapes them this way or that. For if these words had not escaped from my lips, my will had nothing to do with that, my existence would, to be sure, have been still a seaman's existence, but directed on now to me utterly inconceivable lines. No, my will had nothing to do with it. Indeed, no sooner had I made that fateful noise than I became extremely sorry for it. Had the man stopped and faced me, I would have had to retire in disorder, for I had no notion to carry out Captain Giles's idiotic joke, either at my own expense or at the expense of the steward. But here the old human instinct of the chase came into play. He pretended to be deaf, and I, without thinking a second about it, dashed along my own side of the dining table and cut him off at the very door. Why can't you answer when you are spoken to? I asked roughly. He leaned against the lintel of the door. He looked extremely wretched. Human nature is, I fear, not very nice right through. There are ugly spots in it. I found myself growing angry, and that, I believe, only because my quarry looked so woe-begone. Miserable beggar. I went for him without more ado. I understand there was an official communication to the home from the harbour office this morning. Is that so? Instead of telling me to mind my own business, as he might have done, he began to whine with an undertone of impudence. He couldn't see me anywhere this morning. He couldn't be expected to run all over the town after me. Who wants you to, I cried, and then my eyes became open to the inwardness of things, and speeches the triviality of which had been so baffling and tiresome. I told him I wanted to know what was in that letter. 
My sternness of tone and behaviour was only half assumed. Curiosity can be a very fierce sentiment at times. He took refuge in a silly muttering sulkiness. It was nothing to me, he mumbled. I had told him I was going home, and since I was going home he didn't see why he should... That was the line of his argument, and it was irrelevant enough to be almost insulting. Insulting to one's intelligence, I mean. In that twilight region between youth and maturity, in which I had my being then, one is peculiarly sensitive to that kind of insult. I am afraid my behavior to the steward became very rough indeed, but it wasn't in him to face out anything or anybody. Drug habit or solitary tippling, perhaps. And when I forgot myself so far as to swear at him, he broke down and began to shriek. I don't mean to say that he made a great outcry. It was a cynical, shrieking confession, only faint, piteously faint. It wasn't very coherent either, but sufficiently so as to strike me dumb at first. I turned my eyes from him in righteous indignation, and perceived Captain Giles in the veranda doorway, surveying quietly the scene, his own handiwork, if I may express it in that way. His smouldering black pipe was very noticeable in his big paternal fist. So, too, was the glitter of his heavy gold watch-chain across the breast of his white tunic. He exhaled an atmosphere of virtuous sagacity, thick enough for any innocent soul to fly to confidently. I flew to him. You would never believe it, I cried. It was a notification that a master is wanted for some ship. There's a command apparently going about, and this fellow puts the thing in his pocket. The steward screamed out in accents of loud despair, You will be the death of me. The mighty slap he gave his wretched forehead was very loud, too. But when I turned to look at him, he was no longer there. He had rushed away somewhere out of sight. This sudden disappearance made me laugh. This was the end of the incident for me. Captain Giles, however, staring at the place where the steward had been, began to haul at his gorgeous gold chain, till at last the watch came up from the deep pocket like solid truth from a well. Solemnly he lowered it down again, and only then said, Just three o'clock. You will be in time if you don't lose any, that is. In time for what? I asked. Good Lord! For the harbour office. This must be looked into. Strictly speaking, he was right. But I've never had much taste for investigation, for showing people up and all that, no doubt ethically meritorious kind of work and my view of the episode was purely ethical. If anyone had to be the death of the steward, I didn't see why it shouldn't be Captain Giles himself, a man of age and standing and a permanent resident, whereas I, in comparison, felt myself a mere bird of passage in that port. In fact, it might have been said that I had already broken off my connection. I muttered that I didn't think it was nothing to me. Nothing, repeated Captain Giles, giving some signs of quiet, deliberate indignation. Kent warned me you were a peculiar young fellow. You will tell me next that a command is nothing to you, and after all the trouble I've taken, too. The trouble, I murmured, uncomprehending. What trouble? All I could remember was being mystified and bored by his conversation for a solid hour after Tiffin, and he called that taking a lot of trouble? He was looking at me with a self-complacency which would have been odious in any other man. All at once, as if a page of a book had been turned over, disclosing a word which made plain all that had gone before, I perceived that this matter had also another than an ethical aspect. And still I did not move. Captain Giles lost his patience a little. With an angry puff at his pipe, he turned his back on my hesitation. But it was not hesitation on my part. I had been, if I may express myself so, put out of gear mentally. But as soon as I had convinced myself that this stale, unprofitable world of my discontent contained such a thing as a command to be seized, I recovered my powers of locomotion. It's a good step from the officer's home to the harbour office, but with the magic word command in my head, I found myself suddenly on the quay, as if transported there in the twinkling of an eye, before a portal of dressed white stone above a flight of shallow white steps. All this seemed to glide towards me swiftly. The whole great roadstead to the right was just a mere flicker of blue, and the dim, cool hall swallowed me up out of the heat and glare of which I had not been aware till the very moment I passed in from it. The broad inner staircase insinuated itself under my feet somehow. 
Command is a strong magic. The first human beings I perceived distinctly since I had parted with the indignant back of Captain Giles was the crew of the harbour steam launch lounging on the spacious landing about the curtained archway of the shipping office. It was there that my buoyancy abandoned me. The atmosphere of officialdom would kill anything that breathes the air of human endeavour and would extinguish hope and fear alike in the supremacy of paper and ink. I passed heavily under the curtain which the Malay coxswain of the harbour launch raised for me. There was nobody in the office except the clerks writing in two industrious rows. But the head shipping master hopped down from his elevation and hurried along on the thick mats to meet me in the broad central passage. He had a Scottish name, but his complexion was of a rich olive hue. His short beard was jet black, and his eyes, also black, had a languishing expression. He asked confidentially, You want to see him? All lightness of spirit and body having departed from me at the touch of officialdom, I looked at the scribe without animation and asked in my turn wearily, What do you think? Is it any use? My goodness, he has asked for you twice today. This emphatic he was the supreme authority, the marine superintendent, the harbour master, a very great person in the eyes of every single quill driver in the room but that was nothing to the opinion he had of his own greatness. Captain Ellis looked upon himself as a sort of divine pagan emanation, the deputy Neptune for the circumambient seas. If he did not actually rule the waves, he pretended to rule the fate of the mortals whose lives were cast upon the waters. This uplifting illusion made him inquisitorial and peremptory, and as his temperament was choleric, there were fellows who were actually afraid of him. He was redoubtable, not in virtue of his office, but because of his unwarrantable assumptions. I had never had anything to do with him before. I said, oh, he has asked for me twice. Then perhaps I had better go in. You must, you must. The shipping master led the way with a mincing gait round the whole system of desks to a tall and important-looking door, which he opened with a deferential action of the arm. He stepped right in, but without letting go of the handle, and, after gazing reverently down the room for a while, beckoned me in by a silent jerk of the head. Then he slipped out at once and shut the door after me most delicately. Three lofty windows gave on the harbour. There was nothing in them but the dark blue sparkling sea and the paler luminous blue of the sky. My eye caught in the depths and distances of these blue tones the white speck of some big ship just arrived and about to anchor in the outer roadstead. A ship from home after perhaps ninety days at sea. There is something touching about a ship coming in from sea and folding her white wings for a rest. The next thing I saw was the top knot of silver hair surmounting Captain Ellis's smooth red face, which would have been apoplectic if it hadn't had such a fresh appearance. Our deputy Neptune had no beard on his chin and there was no trident to be seen standing in a corner anywhere like an umbrella. But his hand was holding a pen, the official pen, far mightier than the sword in making or marring the fortune of simple toiling men. He was looking over his shoulder at my advance. When I had come well within range, he saluted me by a nerve-shattering, Where have you been all this time? As it was no concern of his, I did not take the slightest notice of the shot. I said simply that I had heard there was a master needed for some vessel, and being a sailing ship man, I thought I would apply. He interrupted me. You are the right man for that job, if there had been twenty others after it, but no fear of that. They are all afraid to catch hold. That's what's the matter. He was very irritated. I said innocently, Are they, sir? I wonder why. Why, he fumed, afraid of the sails. Afraid of a white crew, too much trouble, too much work, too long out here. Easy life and deck chairs more their mark. Here I sit with the consul general's cable before me, and the only man fit for the job not to be found anywhere. I began to think you were funking it too. I haven't been long getting to the office, I remarked calmly. You have a good name out here, though, he growled savagely without looking at me. I am very glad to hear it from you, sir, I said. Yes but you are not on the spot when you are wanted. You know you weren't. That steward of yours wouldn't dare to neglect the message from this office. Where the devil did you hide yourself for the best part of the day? I only smiled kindly down on him 
and he seemed to recollect himself and asked me to take a seat. He explained that the master of a British ship having died in Bangkok, the consul general had cabled to him a request for a competent man to be sent out to take command. Apparently in his mind I was the man from the first, though for the looks of the thing the notification addressed to the sailor's home was general. An agreement had already been prepared. He gave it to me to read, and when I handed it back to him with the remark that I accepted its terms, the deputy Neptune signed it, stamped it with his own exalted hand, folded it in four, it was a sheet of blue fool's cap, and presented it to me, a gift of extraordinary potency, for, as I put it in my pocket, my head swam a little. This is your appointment to the command, he said with a certain gravity. An official appointment binding the owners to conditions which you have accepted. Now, when will you be ready to go? I said I would be ready that very day, if necessary. He caught me at my word with great readiness. The steamer Melita was leaving for Bangkok that evening about seven. He would request her captain officially to give me a passage and wait for me till ten o'clock. Then he rose from his office chair and I got up too. My head swam, there was no doubt about it, and I felt a heaviness of limbs as if they had grown bigger since I had sat down on that chair. I made my bow. A subtle change in Captain Ellis's manner became perceptible as though he had laid aside the trident of Deputy Neptune. In reality, it was only his official pen that he had dropped on getting up. End of chapter 1 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine.